For our scripture reading, commentary, let's turn again to Ezekiel 37. And we have a short reading, verses 24 to 28. But because of the nature of what we have here, I wanted to make sure that we saw it at this time and not try to read it all last time. But here in Ezekiel 37, verse 24, we see where the Lord says through Ezekiel, And David, my servant, shall be king over them. We saw last time how the Lord would gather a remnant, not just physically bringing Israel back into the land after the 70 years captivity in Babylon, but that there would be a spiritual remnant. And we saw that in verse 23, a, a cleansing, a renouncing of idols, and that the Lord would put away their transgression and cleanse them as his people. Well, that was all forward-looking to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was no redemption. There was no justification of sinners in the Old Testament. It was all in type and picture and prophecy, looking forward to Christ's coming. But we see that prophesied here. People always ask me when I say that, well, how did they live? They lived under God's forbearance. That's what Paul writes there in Romans chapter 4 under the forbearance of God, not imputing their sin to them. Why? Because he would impute it to Christ when he died. And so in verse 24, where we pick this up, he mentions David, my servant. Well, David's already dead, had been dead. And yet he says he shall be king over them. This is not referring to some future time where God's going to resurrect David again and place him on the throne in Jerusalem someday, somehow. Now here, I believe that David, when he says, my servant, he's speaking of the seed of David. That promised seed that should come through David's loins and that God would raise him up and put him as king over this remnant of Israel. Here is a picture of the true Israel, not just a natural Israel. If you go over there today and you see all these Jews going around, they're proud of their heritage. They were proud of it when Christ came into the world. They told him, we've never been in bondage. We have Abraham as our father. And uh, said uh, that they had Moses as their lawgiver. And remember what Christ told them. If you had Moses as your, if you believed Moses, he said, you'd believe me because Moses spoke of me. Same thing with Abraham. He said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. So that's who he's speaking of here in this particular portion of Scripture. The raising up of David be the raising up of Christ. And there are some that say when Christ came the first time, he offered himself to Israel and they refused him. And so he had to submit to dying as if that was a second plan on the part of God. And there are some that still say when he came first time as Savior, but he still is not reigning as king. You read the book of Acts and read what the apostles preached. When he raised from the grave and ascended on high, the apostles were pretty clear. He's seated on the throne of David. That's where he reigns today. So this is a fulfilled prophecy right here. We're not sitting around waiting for some future fulfillment here. Because he says, and they shall all have one shepherd. When he speaks of all having one shepherd, he's talking about the true Israel, the remnant. And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. What 
are God's judgments with regard to Christ? Well, hear him. That's what even Moses said back in his day. The Lord would raise up a prophet from among them. He said, hear him. And what is it to observe his statutes? It's to believe on him, come to him. These are all gospel commands that we find already foretold here in uh, the Old Testament. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. A lot of people see this as simply a natural prophecy that God promised that land to Israel and so it's theirs forever. Well, that is true. The reason the nation still exists today, when you see that little sliver of land over there and everybody fighting over it, it's amazing that no one can take it away from them. There was a time when the Lord scattered them into the nations but brought them back. But wherever you see that word forever, not only with regard to the people, this is for they and their children's children forever. Again, read in the book of Acts, chapter 2, and you'll see that Peter preached on this, that this was fulfilled in the pouring out of the Spirit in the Lord drawing his people, his true people, from every land and tribe and nation to Christ. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. There again, it says my servant David, he's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ as being their head, their representative, their ruler forever. So all the way down through here, if you're reading along, just put Christ in the margin, Christ, Christ. It continues in verse 26, it could only be Christ because he says, moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. There was a covenant of works in the Old Testament which condemned everybody under it because none could observe it. But here, speaking of a covenant of peace, of an established peace between God and these of whom he speaks here, but who's making the covenant? He says, I will make a covenant. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the eve of his going to the cross. He told them, this is the New Testament in uh, my blood, which is shed for many. And you can read over also in Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10. All of that has to do with the covenant of peace that God has established through the life and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no peace. That's what the covenant is. It's the covenant in his blood. And he says it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. He came to establish it. He did. He earned and established that righteousness necessary. And then God once for all and forever imputed that righteousness to this people that he had chosen from beginning of time all the way through the end of time. And it's an everlasting covenant. It can never be undone. I'm thankful. People say, well, if we could just go back to the way things were before the fall, you don't want to. That was temporary. There was no righteousness there. Adam was made upright, but not righteous. Righteousness doesn't change. And that's why there was no true righteousness earned and established until Christ came and did it. And that is an everlasting covenant with them. And he said, I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. Again, historically, when he brought the children of Israel back from Babylon, that sanctuary was rebuilt. But here, in connection with this everlasting covenant and the covenant of peace, the sanctuary of which he is speaking there, again, 
the writer to the Hebrews has a lot to say about this, that is Christ, the sanctuary. People mistakenly call our meeting places sanctuary. We're meeting in the sanctuary. <laughs> There's only one sanctuary today, and that is the person of Christ. The building is not the sanctuary. His church meets here in this building, but the sanctuary is Christ. He's the one who has been set apart in holiness and righteousness. And when he says, I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore, where two or three are gathered in his name, what does Christ say? There I am in their midst. I don't know about you, but that kind of excites me to think that here we are meeting. <laughs> And God's sanctuary is right here in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 27, he says the same thing. My tabernacle also shall be with them. The sanctuary was the inner part of the tabernacle, and then there was the overall tabernacle. So it's using types and pictures of that tabernacle and sanctuary here, but to speak of Christ. He says, my tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is not talking about a natural Israel. This is talking about the elect, the spiritual Israel made up of Jew and Gentile, bond or free in Christ. And the heathen, that's the nations, that's the Gentiles, that's the word that they translate heathen, shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. How do they know that? Well, they've been made part of it. And so the Israel that God has sanctified, yes, even though the roots were in national Israel for a time, yet the Lord always purposed that the nations should also know him through that same Israel. He says, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them, where forevermore. That's not talking about some earthly temple that's got to be rebuilt and Christ is going to come back now and live there in Jerusalem and that temple being rebuilt. No, he is the temple. In fact, you remember when they were looking at the temple with Christ walking around it, marveling at the structure and it is it's quite a quite a structure every once in a while you see what they call the wailing wall and you see just how high that wall that's that's the ruins of the foundation the outer wall of that old temple if you if you look at the pictures when they show that to you you'll see over the top of it back in the distance a little ways there's a gold dome a dome of the rock they call it that's a muslim shrine and it's one of their sacred places. They, the Lord purposed that it be built right there where the old temple was. But the walls, when you see people there in front of the Wailing Wall, and they, they do this, they call themselves a stiff-necked people. That's why they're actually doing that. They're acknowledging we're a stiff-necked people. And then they slip little prayers in there. And what are they praying for? Rebuilding of the temple that... God would answer their prayers and establish Israel again as a, as a nation, as a, a power. It's all self-serving, but it, that's not the temple. Never will be. Because the temple, what Christ said when he went into that temple and they found all those, you could read about this in John 2, the money changers, the oxen, the sheep, it was a busy place. And the Lord made a scourge of small cords and he drove them all out of the temple. And uh, he just told them, take these things hence and don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. Whose house was it? His father's house. Why did he purpose it? That it, even after the 70 years captivity be rebuilt because it was to serve as a type of his son the Lord Jesus Christ 
And when they answered him and said, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? They mocked him. What, by what authority are you coming in here? You know, that's when the glory of the Lord entered into that temple in the presence of Christ. And that's when the Lord told them, said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. And they mocked him. And you can see they were thinking just in terms of the brick and mortar, the marble, all those things. And they began to say, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake, this is in John 2 and verse 21, of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples, John 2, 22, remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture, the word which Jesus had said. There's a bunch of people that hold this Bible that still haven't believed his word. Because their eyes haven't been opened. They're still contributing for a temple fund over there. And boy, does Israel love it. You talk about tourism. That's a huge treasure right there. And who's backing them? Religious organizations, so-called Christians. Do you realize how anti-Christ that is? And I don't mind saying it very plainly. Because what they're doing is sending money over for the rebuilding of a physical temple that God has already destroyed. And that Christ had said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it again. He's talking about the temple of his body. You're telling me now, after all that, that we're going to set Christ aside and go back to a physical temple? That's just nothing but unbelief. But we've got a lot of people. And rich preachers. I looked up one the other day. Someone asked me, you know, have you seen the list of how much preachers are making and everything? I noticed my name wasn't on there, and I'm glad. But there's a big one that promotes all this Israel uh, nonsense. And he's worth literally millions. Millions. He's on the Fortune 500 list. These are preachers. And what are they doing? They're taking advantage, just like the money changers in Christ's day, making merchandise of what is to be to the glory of Christ alone. But here we have a beautiful prophecy that the Lord gave to Ezekiel that describes how God purposed to bring a remnant back into the land and that through that remnant he would bring forth a people, an elect people from every tribe, nation, and tongue for whom Christ would be established as their king, as their shepherd. And all you have to do is read John 10 and realize that's, that's Christ. That's who he's talking about. One fold, one shepherd. And I'm thankful it's so. Gracious Father, thank you for your word, how plain it is. Give us eyes to see and hearts to look to Christ alone. Pray that you would bless our meeting together to his honor and glory. Praise in his precious name. Amen.